Uh, I'd like to begin this year by praying something for you. So let's just bow our heads. And uh, those of you who are watching at, at home or online, um, you can bow your head too. You don't have to see me every second. And let's let, uh, let's let some words not just wash over us, but work their way into us today. Father, um, I think we feel at risk. I think we're concerned that maybe nothing will change. Or maybe we're concerned things will get worse. And those thoughts can give place to a kind of fear in our hearts. And when we are afraid, our resolve tends to weaken and our strength tends to weaken. So I'm going to ask that you open our eyes to see what you are doing right now. I'm going to ask that you help us to see what you intend to do in the days that lie ahead. I'm going to ask that you help us understand what you are about in our lives and in our world. Help us find strength in that, in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, we live in the state of New York, and uh, New York has had some strategies about addressing uh, COVID realities. And so I thought I would talk a little bit about that today, not from a political point of view, because uh, quite honestly, all politics does now is divide people. And I don't think that helps. I think that what we need to do is find ways to come together, not tear each other apart. Uh, but I think it's also true that this season of COVID, uh, uh, these are some things that tend to be true. Number one is it's lasted a lot longer than anyone thought. I can remember when we were doing our very first Sunday online only, and we thought maybe this could go two to four weeks. And 10 months later, <laughs> I mean, we're still dealing with this reality. And it's taken a greater toll than anyone had calculated. And it has increased stress, which has revealed stress fractures in our society, in relationships, in our homes, deep within ourselves. And people are struggling. And the question is, can we talk about that? Um, I think families are struggling a lot. Uh, families, um, are spending more time together and, and they may feel like they're getting less attention even though they're closer together proximity-wise and that's creating increased tension. And I think people feel more isolated because we have less connection and less access to people that, that we used to regularly get together with and enjoy their company. And there's a new set of questions that are being asked and, and some of them have to do with their faith and their values. And does, does God or does faith or does scripture, does it have any benefit in my life in a season like this? And so that's why we're starting a series this morning called I'm Struggling. Many families are spending more time together, and some of that is good, and some of that is challenging. And uh, parents may have different opinions about how to manage this season of COVID that we're in. Not all families are on the same page. Some families are not in the same chapter. Some families are not in the same book. Some families are not in the same library. And what I can tell you is that's been true even in church family, like the variance of opinion about things related to COVID in any church family is actually quite, uh, quite wide. And uh, children have been exposed to information they don't completely understand, and it can make them very afraid. Uh, children have experienced increased isolation from their friends and from the kinds of activities that they used to enjoy. Students, most of their interactions with their friends now are virtual. There's less structure, sometimes less supervision. There's more latitude, particularly related to online things. And parents are afraid that kids are falling behind academically. Sports has mostly been sidelined, so the outlet that lots of kids had to burn off some energy to make some friends, that has been taken off of the calendar. 
and there's been less connection with an interaction even with their church friends. Married people are feeling a lot more tension. Studies show that physical intimacy is down. Pornography is up. Domestic violence is up. Depression is up. Income is down. Alcohol use, up. Anger, up. Avoidance of conversations, up. Resentment, up. Recreational drug use, up. Not just a little, a lot. And if we think this is challenging, wait until we start navigating back towards something that we remember as normal, because we have set a lot of new latitude realities. And if you think everyone in the house is going to go back to the way things were, you're in for some surprises. Some of the adjustments we have made have become the new norm. So, uh, by the way, if you have been a person who's followed the recommendations for uh, Center of Disease Control guidelines, you have been frustrated by not being able to get with parents, by not being able to get with friends, and you've been concerned about how they're managing a season like this. If you're a person who has not followed the CDC guidelines, you've probably been fearful about what you can catch or cause someone else to get, or you've been frustrated by limitations put on you you don't agree with. Healthcare workers, first responders have had to face unique challenges because their exposure rates have been significantly increased and they have to come home to their families. You should hear some of the stories that I hear about what people have to go through before they feel safe walking into their own home. So everything I just said, you've heard other places. So now I'm going to talk about something you don't hear anywhere else. It's not on social media. It's not on regular media. None of our politicians are talking about it. You're not hearing this information anywhere else. And it's what God's word has to say about seasons like this. Does scripture have anything to say about what we're going through? And the Bible is filled with stories. It's filled with stories about families who struggled with the demands that were being placed on them or the challenges that were being set before them. And there is so much good information that has been handed down for thousands of years that it would be foolhardy for us to ignore it. In fact, what I would recommend is that if you're, if you're listening to this, you might hear something that really helps you. That's great. But you might hear something that another family comes to your mind. And what I want you to do is, is, is give them the link to this talk because they need help too. And they're not going to get it in all the usual resources of information that people are accessing today. So we're going to look at a couple passages. One is in 1 Samuel chapter 22. There's a man named David, and he was, uh, became king of Israel. And it says, David left Gath. This was before he was king. And he escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. And all those, all those who were in distress or in debt or discontented, gathered around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. From there, David went to Mizpah in Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, would you let my father and my mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? So he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. And then a passage from Psalm 133, a song that was written by David about this season. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of, of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. We will be defined by what is happening to us or by what God is doing in us. We will be defined by what is happening to us or by what God is doing in us. I see a lot of people being defined 
by the former. David's family was far from perfect. Uh, there was a big occasion where the entire family was invited to, and they actually left David out, literally left him in the field. He never was invited to be part of it. There was another occasion when David was taking supplies to his brothers who were serving in the military, and when he got there, he had some questions, and all of his questions were met by demeaning remarks by his brother to him. They were more concerned about the opinions of their fellow soldiers than what their brother thought. David was brave enough to fight predators who tried to attack the sheep. He was brave enough to fight a giant by the name of Goliath. In fact, it's one of the shortest battles in all of human history. If it was a pay-per-view event, you would have been frustrated at how quickly it was over. He was brave enough, and David was also a poet. And he was a musician, he was an artist, and he was good enough at that that it landed him a job in the palace. That's how good his music was. But while he was serving for that king whose name was Saul, what he came to realize is Saul was a really insecure person, and insecure people are always uncomfortable with people around them that have competence or confidence. Makes them uneasy. So Saul needed to get him out of the palace a little bit more, so he would send him out on military raids and military excursions. And David would go out and he would be incredibly successful, so successful that they started writing songs about him. One of the songs, the lyrics was this, Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. <laughs> and Saul did not like that song at all. And he became so incensed, he actually attempted on multiple occasions to end David's life. David's loyalty was repaid with attempted murder. And David eventually found a good and safe hiding place in a cave. Saul's paranoia had threatened not just David, but anyone connected with David, especially his family. So when David's family heard that he had a safe place to hide, they went to be with him. They knew they were no longer safe at home. By the way, they were joined by roughly 400 men who were seriously struggling in life, and they found a safe place with David. And David wound up becoming their commander. The family that couldn't get along had nowhere else to go. Think about that. So David's brothers began to see him in a very different light. They saw him as a gifted person in organizing groups of people. They saw him as strategic in terms of provision and protection. They saw him as charismatic and competent, and they saw how impressive he actually was. And when David's brothers had no one else to impress, they actually became impressed with him. The, the challenges their family was facing brought out the best in David, and they noticed it. Think about this. The challenges we go through can bring out the best in us, not the worst in us. And people will notice. People who couldn't make life work anywhere else found a way to make life work together. It was very interesting. David was also a person who prayed. And anyone who spent much time with him would have observed him going away for a private conversation with God and then coming back with a kind of insight and confidence that made life work even better. And he would have encouraged them to do the same because he didn't think that these private conversations were unique only to him. He would have encouraged them. You see, this is something that's worth knowing. When nothing else is working, God is still working. When nothing else is working, God is still working. Slowly, people stopped being defined by what was happening to them, and they started to be defined by what God was doing in them. This is the role that we can play in our world. This is the role we can play in our world. We can go on rants like everyone else and talk about all the things that we don't like. That tribe is really, really large and really, really loud. Or we can exercise another option. As people of God, we can see ourselves differently and the options that we have are different. God's people can reveal God's saving purposes right where we are right now. For the first time in their lives, for the first time in their lives, David's brothers 
are living together in peace. God can use difficult circumstances to draw people together. And he did. And he does. It's amazing what can happen when we find something more important than our preferences or our offenses that draws us together. It's quite a remarkable thing. So David was moved and he was inspired. This new interaction he was having with his brothers had a profound effect on him. And because he's a poet and a musician, he decided to try to find words and a melody line that would capture it. And so he started searching because this is what artists do. They start thinking through experiences in their life that they can compare it to. Is there an illustration? Is there a metaphor? Is there an analogy for what is going on in my life right now? And he came across one. He couldn't ignore it. There were so many similarities. He had to include it. He remembered one of the most significant things that ever happened to him. It was the day that the prophet Samuel came to his house and visited his family and called him in out of the field. David came running from the field, not sure why he was called, and standing there in front of his family and in front of his neighbors and in front of the prophet of God, the prophet took out a horn that had been hollowed out to contain liquid. Inside of it was oil, and he uncorked it, and he just poured it. He emptied it out on top of David, and the oil just flowed all over him. And then the prophet began to speak words into his life about who God intended him to be and what God intended him to do. And those words opened up a whole new possibility, things he never thought of, things he never considered, things he never thought were possible for his life. Someone saw in David what God saw in David, and they said it out loud. How powerful could that be today? This is the image that comes to David's mind when he's trying to find words to describe how he felt. How is, what is the connection here when his brothers are, the, are together with him in unity? When you are in unity with your brothers, you begin to see your future better. You begin to see what's possible. He knew he had a purpose and a calling, but when you're together with people in unity, you begin to see that a little more clearly. And he, that, that vision, that picture was getting a little clearer and his confidence was getting a little greater. Every family has some level of brokenness and dysfunction. Your family is not the exception to that rule. Don't get me wrong. Some families take that to levels that's hard to describe. But all of us suffer from it. And some of us have been defined by things that our family has done to us or said to us. Hear this. This is really important. Families have prophetic influence, whether you believe it or not. There are things that were said to you in your family of origin, and it has shaped your life for better or for worse. There are things that were said to you that you either just accepted or you've tried to spend most of your life proving that they aren't true. And while they may not have intended to define you, that's the impact that they had on you. And so we just kind of, we go through life making series of decisions based on what was spoken into our lives, sometimes unintentionally or out of frustration or out of ignorance or out of darkness or out of sin. It was just spoken into our lives and it becomes like a bit and bridle in a horse's mouth. We come into situations and we just feel ourselves pulled one way or the other. And there are lots of opportunities we never step into because somebody said something that wound up being a prophecy in our life, a prophecy we wish never would have been spoken. That's why people are struggling with their families. So, how do we become a family where unity reveals our potential rather than being defined by our mistakes or our weaknesses or others' assumptions? And what I will tell you is this is one of the reasons we need the family of God. Because your family might never get this right. But that doesn't mean you have no options. So here's some keys to unity in our families. By the way, this is not asking everyone to agree about everything. If you're a parent, 
you will know that there comes a point in your child's life where they think that you are wrong about everything. Happened in, in our house. And there were days when my kids were disagreeing with me and I would just say, the sky is blue, just to listen to them disagree about that. Insecure and unhealthy people cannot tolerate anyone who thinks differently. This is not a call to get everybody on the same page in terms of preferences in your house. You're not going to like the same TV programs. You're not going to like the same books. You're not going to like the same music. You're not going to like the same social media outlets. You're not going to, if that's your goal, then what you're actually attempting to do is to create a mini me instead of helping them become what God has called them to be. And that is not a worthy goal, trying to create many me. So number one, learn to accept others. Learn to accept others. By the way, this doesn't mean that you agree with everything they do or you approve of everything they do. Most people actually assume that the power of rejection is what shapes the behavior of others. But it doesn't have the effect that we would hope that it would have. People are not changed for the better by rejection. People are not changed for the better by rejection, and you don't have to go past your own experience to know that's true. Oh, you can get some compliance. That's not the same thing. Rejection doesn't change people for the better. We're called to accept one another. So you might have a kid in your house or a parent in your house that likes a different football team. I mean, I don't get it. Uh, some people don't know what it's like to be a Bills fan. Most people don't know what it's like to be a Bills fan. We were playing Pittsburgh a couple weeks ago. There's just a few minutes left in the game. We're up by 11 points. All the Pittsburgh fans are thinking like this. We can still pull this out. All the Bills fans are thinking like this. We could still lose this. There's experience behind those things. And, and, and your kid may choose a different football team. Your, your kid will probably choose different music. In fact, if you really don't like the music that your kids are listening to, don't tell them that's garbage and that's not music. Tell them you absolutely love it. And that will so offend them that they were, they're quite sure that they picked wrong. They'll try again. How are we to accept one another? Romans 15 says, accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. How did Jesus accept you? Did he require your perfection and your compliance and perfect behavior before he let you into his family? No, because Jesus knows the power of acceptance. Once you're in his family, all things are possible. But until you're in his family, nothing really is. And then learn to be for others. Be for them. We don't have to put others down in order to be lifted up. Our world, this frustrates me a lot, our world thinks neutrality is a virtue. The best our culture can create is apathy. We have significant racial issues in our country. Do you know the best our world can come up with? I'm against racism. Okay. Being against people who you don't like isn't actually going to help the people who are being hurt. Who are we for? How are we going to help them? We can actually encourage others. That's not a common thing today. People are not encouraged in our culture. Everything that's said, everything that's posted, it's all gone through with a fine tooth comb and people look for the thing that they can criticize you about it. We can actually celebrate good things when they happen in others' lives. This is what it says in Luke 6. Uh, Verses 32 and 33, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Not a big deal. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. God calls us to actually, to be for people, to want what's best for their lives. 
If you want to be for people, here's something you can do. You can pray for people. By the way, not the same thing as praying about people. Have a private conversation with God. You'd be surprised how many options that that will give you. Here's a question to ask yourself when you're praying for someone or about someone. You can ask, do I want what's best for them? Or do I want them to change so that it's better for me? That's a good question. Prayer sorts that out. Here's a challenge. I'll throw it out. Before you post, pray. Before you post, pray. Uh, third, learn to be real with others. And I'll ask the worship team to, to come out. Learn to be real with others. Pretenders don't change. They just pretend. Honest people are the ones who change. People think that pride is all about showing off. Pride is actually a lot more about hiding than showing. In fact, what you show is often used as a way to hide something about yourself you don't want others to see. When your kids are doing something that you really don't like, there's probably a story in your life about how you did something very similar and it didn't go so well. That's why you have such a strong emotional reaction. What would happen if you sat down with your kid and he said, look, I have some strong feelings about this and let me tell you why. When I was about your age, I actually exercised that option. And it brought more pain and frustration in my life that I could bear at that age, or quite honestly, at any age. I carry the wounds of that still. And you don't have to make the same choice, and you don't have to carry those wounds. But to tell that story requires a kind of humility that a lot of parents are afraid. If I say that, then they will say, well, you did it, why can't I? So we never teach them. We just scold them. James 5 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. That's what being real with people is. David was running for his life. And maybe he had begun to doubt the words of the prophet that had been spoken over him. But when he lived in unity, not the same preferences, but the same purpose. His confidence was renewed. So how can you show acceptance in your family? Don't try to create many me's Try to discern who God has created them to be. How can you demonstrate that you are for family members? This is actually going to require some time and some energy and probably some resources. How can you show you are for them when they fail? or when they succeed? And in what ways are you real with your family? Do you let your family know your thoughts? Uh, it's been a while, but I was in a conversation. There were about a dozen people in the room. And some of the most painful things that have, have ever been said to me by people I respected and cared about were said to me that day. And, and someone said, I know you're hurt. And my response was, I'm not hurt. And to this day, I wonder how the conversation may have gone differently if I just said, I'm deeply hurt. And let me tell you why. Do you acknowledge where you have failed and what you have learned? Do you admit your own fears and your own pain? These are incredibly powerful influences. If your family is struggling, seek unity. It's amazing what God will do. Let's bow our heads this morning. So Father, I know um, the stresses are higher than we're used to and the options are fewer than we're used to and the frustrations are more than we're used to and the control seems less than we're used to. And we are wondering if, if more than just ourselves are falling apart, 
if a kind of disintegration is going on that can hamstring a future for a lifetime. And I ask that you would help us know that in the midst of this, we can accept one another, we can be for one another, we can be real with one another, and in that, you will do some of the most amazing things we have ever seen in our lives. We thank you for that, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Let's all stand together.